Hey gardening friends, welcome back. This is Susan from Flower Child Gardens. And today we're going to talk about how to start a hedge for your own garden. I think this is a fun topic. I thought it might be helpful to share my own experience and some tips. And these tips are good to get you started thinking about hedging, especially as a home gardener in California. In this video, we're going to talk about plants that are ideal for creating a hedge, how to space and plant them out, how to start creating that shape of a hedge and how to maintain them, common gardening tools and supplies that are used for creating and maintaining a hedge. Finally, plants that are typically used in hedges in California gardens. So let's get started. Let's first talk about hedges in general. A lot of times we're creating a hedge to create some sort of screening or privacy. And in California, most of us live in larger cities. A lot of our properties are spaced really close together. So we're kind of trying to create some privacy between our neighbors and also against a busy street. We're seeking out the sense of privacy and also a sense of security so that people aren't peering into our lives and peering into our property too. And then sometimes we use hedges to pretty much cover up something that's ugly. You know, like if you have a really old worn down fence, it's not very fun to look at something that's kind of scrappy. Creating a hedge covers it up and greens it up. It makes it really pleasant to look at something that is living, lush, and happy. And then some of us have larger gardens and we don't know what the heck to do with all that space. But we do know that we want to grow vegetables. We love roses. And we want an area where we could just relax and sit down and maybe have a nice dinner on a warm evening. So in that sense, hedges are really useful in creating and defining spaces and organizing those spaces so that there are distinct growing areas and possibly outdoor rooms. And then some of us have issues with deer, you know, or maybe issues with people just trespassing onto our property. And so we're looking to create some sort of barrier, something that is unexpected attractive to cross over. Maybe something that's thorny. And finally, maybe we're just really interested in the overall look of our garden. We have a certain aesthetic that we're trying to achieve, and perhaps we have a home that is more modern, more architectural, and we want a landscape that really complements those clean lines. Whatever the case is, I think hedges are valuable and bring a lot of utility to a home garden, and they overall enhance the look of a garden and make it more beautiful. So let's talk about plants that are ideal for creating a hedge because not all plants are good for hedges. In general, I have four basic criteria when I look at a plant that is appropriate for a hedge. The first criteria I have is, is this plant reliable and predictable. You know, when you're creating a hedge, a lot of times you're creating it with one single plant and you're repeating it over and over again. And when you're repeating that plant, you want that plant to grow at the same pace, at the same rate, at the same height, and with the same growth habit. It's really important to select a plant that you know is predictable, that you know that it's going to grow this much a certain year, it's going to look a certain way. The second criteria I have is, is this plant tough? Is it durable? Is it bulletproof? Can it handle varying conditions like pollution, traffic, weather conditions, drought periods? But more importantly, is this plant strong and disease resistant? When you're planting a hedgerow of maybe 10 plants and maybe a couple of them get struck by disease, it can cause an interruption in the visual look of the hedge. Because we're trying to achieve some sort of unity, we want to make sure that these plants are reliable and they are bulletproof. You know, they are not going to get a random disease. Suddenly that hedge is going to break down. So for example, in the Bay Area, there is this plant that was used pretty often for hedges years ago called Fetinia. Fetinia is an attractive evergreen plant that has really beautiful new foliage that's red and bronzy looking. It covers an area really well, but it's quite susceptible to fire blight. And fire blight is a really contagious disease that affects a lot of plants. In the Bay Area, you're going to see a lot of fire blight occurring on ornamental and edible pears, apricots, 
apples, but even though those are fruit trees and Fatinia is an ornamental, Fatinia still gets affected by fire blight because essentially they're all part of the same plant family, which is Rosaceae, the rose family. And you'll see this happening a lot where diseases can travel between different plants across a single family. So this is kind of why we practice crop rotation when we're growing vegetables or when farming is involved. We don't want that disease to overwinter and affect the next season's crop or next year's crop. The same applies to ornamental plants. When some plants in a hedge get affected by a serious disease, it can cause rapid decline. You're going to have some empty spots in the hedge and no longer can it function the way you want it to perform. Form. If you wanted it to be a barrier, a privacy screen, it's no longer that. The third criteria that I look for is, can this handle a lot of pruning, especially aggressive pruning? Is this a type of plant that can respond well to pruning? And although this is not a necessary criteria for creating a hedge, I think it's a handy one in case you want to manage the hedge's size and the growth, in case you want to correct some pruning mistakes, and in case you want to create very clean shapes. You really want to shear the plants and create clean lines or create rounded shapes. A lot of times when you're trying to create some sort of shape, whether it's rectangular or round, you need a lot of material to work with. And you need that plant to have a lot of branches and a lot of foliage. To create branches and foliage, you need to keep on making heading cuts, which are pretty much random cuts that force the plant to multiply in branches and foliage. So whatever plant you choose for the hedge needs to be able to respond well to those cuts. It needs to be able to react and to produce that branching effect, but it also needs to be healthy overall. It needs to be able to withstand lots of impact, basically. A lot of times we're trying to maintain a shrub that is a certain height, whether it's four feet tall or maybe eight feet tall. And oftentimes we use plants that grow larger than that, if we are trying to maintain a height of 8 feet tall, the actual plant grows like a tree to 15 feet tall, that plant needs to be able to handle severe cuts. Sometimes when you have a really mature hedge and it's been growing for 15-20 years, it may actually outgrow its space and it may go into the sidewalk. It may be rubbing up against your house or your car and you want to contain it. But containing it is a lot of high maintenance. It requires a lot of constant pruning and shearing. So it might be a pain in the butt, basically. If you have the right type of plant, you could do some radical renovation on it and basically start it over. Do some severe cuts and let it sprout back up so that it's at a size and shape that you want over the next few years. And then maybe sometimes you make pruning mistakes. Who doesn't make pruning mistakes? It happens. You know, you may be thinking that you're cutting one little branch, but it actually is connected to a bunch of branches and suddenly you have a big gaping hole. If you have a plant that responds well to pruning, most likely it's gonna bush out, green up within a matter of months. So that mistake is covered up, no one will remember it, it's all good. The last criteria that I look for in a plant is highly dependent on the type of look you're going for for your hedge. Are you going for an informal natural hedge or are you going for a more formal hedge with crisp clean lines? So if you're going for more of the formal look, you're going to be doing a lot of heading cuts, a lot of shearing. Do you want to select a plant that could look good even when it's being cut? Plants with smaller foliage are less noticeable when you cut into them. But if you have plants that have really large broadleaf foliage, when you make the cut, it's really obvious. It looks really tore up. It looks rough. It looks like a bad haircut. Depending on what you're looking for, if you want to do a lot of shaping, a lot of shearing, then go for the smaller foliage plants. So now that you've decided on your perfect, awesome plant for hedging, what do you do next? How do you plant them out? 
when you go to the nursery, you're going to see the plant in the plant container and there's a plant label with a lot of useful information and some of the information may tell you, okay, this plant grows this big and you should probably plant it out this far apart. And that's fine and all if you're going to use that plant for its original use, for its original habit. But hedging is a completely different story. With hedging, we don't treat plants as individual plants. We treat them as a whole. We combine multiple plants together so that they are a single continuous unit. We want them to be visually continuous. If a plant label says, oh, you should probably plant this out 15 feet apart, maybe you actually want to plant it closer together, maybe at 10 feet apart, so that the branches are intertwined and it really looks visually together and connected. But definitely be careful about planting too close together. And I see this pretty often in the Bay Area, especially with trees. When you have plants that are that close apart, there's a lot of competition with space, water, and nutrients. And in the long run, none of those plants are going to thrive and be successful. Now that you've decided on the proper spacing for the plants, definitely want to make sure that you have proper irrigation and that irrigation is spot on and it's feeding every single one of those plants consistently. Really trying to achieve the same growth rate, the pace, the same habit. It's important that each one of those plants gets the amount of water that they need, especially in California. After planting it, after setting up the irrigation, and after doing some mulching, how do you actually really start a hedge? What do you do from that on? And how do you care for it? But to start a hedge, it really depends on the look that you're trying to go for. If you're doing an informal hedge that looks more natural, you're basically embracing the natural habit and the characteristic of the plant. There really isn't too much pruning needed. Most of the pruning involves structural pruning and it's not too much throughout the year. And you're just trying to maintain the size so that it fits within that space and there's some general uniformity going on. With informal hedges, you hardly ever do heading cuts or shear. No, no, okay. <laughs> You want a natural look. Whereas if you're doing a formal look for a hedge, then heading cuts are absolutely necessary. You're trying to create a shape, a crisp line, or maybe like rounded forms or topiary forms, maybe animals. I don't know. Whatever floats your boat, okay? go for it. To create those shapes, you need a lot of plant material to work with, a lot of branches and a lot of foliage. You need a lot of stuff to cut through. The more foliage and branches you have, the more sharper and obvious those shapes are. So in order to do this, you do need to make heading cuts, usually by doing some shearing, whether it's hand shearing or electric trimmers. Whenever you do heading cuts on a branch, that branch basically multiplies. One branch may turn into two branches or potentially four branches. If you cut those branches, it may multiply exponentially. You end up getting a really bushy plant to work from, and then you can kind of carve out whatever your shape is. After you've developed the initial bushiness of your plant and they've grown for a while, you definitely want to do go in at least once a year, if not more, to create more bushiness and to shape it out. This requires more heading cuts with the shears. Heading cuts always multiply, whereas structural cuts and thinning cuts usually reduce and clean up and open up. Also super important, if you're going to create a hedge, whether it's natural looking or whether it's very geometric and rectangular, you do want to make sure that you do create those cuts at an angle. Ideally, if you're creating a wall of greenery, you want to make sure that wall is angled kind of like a pyramidal shape. So the top part is narrow and then the bottom part is a little wider. And it doesn't have to be an obvious pyramid. It could be just a slight decline. The plant overall can get as much sunlight as possible for photosynthesis. What you don't want to do is this you know, where the top is really heavy and wide and the bottom is thin. And you don't want to do this where it's completely straight, but you do want to create a slightly declined pyramidal shape. Let's talk about some of the tools and supplies that you can use to create a hedge. For creating an informal natural one, you really don't need too much. Bypass pruners that you can use, like as a hand tool, is helpful for creating structural pruning cuts of thin branches. But then when you're working on larger branches, you may want to come in with a handsaw. 
So with bypass pruners, you can get some pruners from Felco or also ARS. Those are both reliable brands. And with the handsaw, gardeners really like using the brand Silky. Maybe your natural hedge is actually quite tall and you can't reach it. And so you may need to use a ladder. If that hedge is grown on unstable sloped ground. You might want to pick up a tripod ladder. A tripod ladder has three legs and it is generally more stable. If you want to spend money on a tripod, Pod ladder. Hasegawa is the brand to go and if you are on a budget you can get one from Stokes. Maybe you don't want to even use a ladder. Maybe it's too much stuff to have around your garden in your shed but you still have a tall hedge. In that case you may want to pick up a reach printer or maybe a pull printer. So a reach printer is similar to a bypass printers. It's just that it's really long. One end has bypass printers and then it's a long pole. Other end is actually the handle where you squeeze to cut Cut. I have an ARS reach printer that's about six feet long and it rotates. It's really good. If you have to prune some thicker branches but not too thick, you can go in with a pole printer. And my pole printer is from Fiskars. I got it from Home Depot. A pole printer is different from a reach printer. Reach printer is really for fine work, really thin branches. A pole printer will prune off thicker branches and it uses a lever system with a string. But how about formal hedges? You know, when you're trying to create those shapes, those clean lines, those boxes. What type of garden tools and supplies do you use for those situations? All of those tools and supplies that I mentioned earlier is totally needed for formal hedging. But at the same time, formal hedges is a little more involved. There's a lot more heading cuts involved, a lot more shearing to create those clean lines you're going to be cutting a lot of branches so that it's consistent in this case it's really handy to have a pair of shearing tools you know like uh, hedging shears whether it's hand tool or whether it's an electric trimmer they are going to save you a lot of time and essentially when you're using hedging tools you're cutting multiple branches with one single swift move so it's super time saving if you do plan on getting some hand hedging shears make sure that you select one that has a long handle it's gonna be much better for your body you know creating a hedge and maintaining one is backbreaking work i mean it's very physical. It's lots of redundant movements and you're using your whole body in fact. You may think that you're only using your arms and you're going to feel it in your forearms but you're going to actually feel it in your entire body especially your lower back. If you have hedging shears that have a longer handle you have a longer reach. Um, you don't have to reach as far you know you don't have to bend as low versus having a shorter one you really have to extend your body and over time as you are maintaining your hedge I mean that pain builds up season after season year after year so if you can find the right tools to save you from extending your body too much it's gonna help with your overall comfort as you're gardening and the last thing that I would say is definitely have a tarp on hand tarps are really useful and they're so affordable I like using a tarp that's about five feet by seven feet wide and I will just lay it on the ground as I'm doing my heading cuts and those cuts are gonna fall onto the tarp so cleanup is really easy. When you're shearing, it could get messy really fast. The last thing I want to talk about is loppers. Many folks may use loppers to prune. Yes, to actually prune trees and shrubs. Loppers are not designed to actually prune. They are intended to break down branches that have already been taken off. When you have pruned off a long branch and it's not fitting into your green bin, you use your loppers to break it into smaller parts so that it all fits into the bin. That's what it is intended to do. But loppers make rough, blunt cuts. And when you're pruning with loppers, those cuts can be blunt and they can be susceptible to infections, disease, and to insects. They may die back and affect the branch that it's attached to. If you do have to make larger pruning cuts, I suggest that you use hand saws versus loppers, but loppers are totally fine when you're trying to break up material to throw into the trash bin. They're great for doing that. I have a favorite pair that I love to use. It's from Fiskars. It's called Power Gear 2. And Power Gear 2 is a patented leverage system. It makes cutting through branches so easy and simple. It's very gratifying. It feels like butter. One of my garden mentors 
told me about this garden tool. So Ella, if you're watching, thank you so much. She is like the queen of gardening tools. She's got the best stuff. Now let's get to the really fun stuff and let's talk about plants that are commonly used for gardens in California to create a hedge. I want to talk about plants that are good for traditional style gardens, Mediterranean climate gardens, and also California native gardens. So let's start with traditional plants. First off, camellias are excellent for creating low hedges and also tall hedges. They grow at different heights. Some are four feet tall, some eight feet tall, some 15 to 20 feet tall. So you have a lot of options there. And the bloom color varies and also the bloom period varies depending on the type, sasinqua, japonica, etc. And camellias are actually tougher than you think. A lot of times we do kind of associate camellias with traditional water hungry gardens and they perform exceptionally well when they get regular water but you'd be surprised that if you have an established camellia it can survive drought periods it can survive very low water conditions and I only realized this when I was helping my friends garden out and she had an existing camellia that was there for over 20 years her garden had no existing irrigation it was completely relying on hand watering or natural rain fall in LA you know in LA in Echo Park Silver Lake area and it was alive it had foliage it bloomed a little bit not too much but in any case it was okay it did not die so camellias are really tough they can handle pruning so well and even if you have a camellia that's way too tall way too big you want it to be smaller you can renovate it you can start it over the next one that's really popular for traditional gardens and also all sorts of gardens, modern, whatever, is pittosporum. And pittosporum is an evergreen shrub. It comes generally in two size groups. One that's really tall, maybe about 10 to 15 feet, but maintained at about 8 feet. And a smaller group of pittosporums that are generally about 5 feet or shorter. They both require moderate to regular water and prefer light shade. The taller one is excellent for creating that privacy between your neighbors. You can shear it if you wanted to. You can leave it loose and natural. We can't talk about hedging without talking about boxwood because that's pretty much the first plant that comes to mind whenever hedges come up, especially in a traditional garden. And just like pittosporum, boxwood comes in generally two different size groups. So there are the taller ones which grow to be about six to eight feet tall. There are some that grow to be about two to three feet. You really want to create those shapes or even like topiary forms or clean crisp lines. They have really small foliage so if you make those heading cuts they're hardly noticeable. It kind of blends in. It's all good. If you go to Philoli you may notice that they use a lot of tall narrow yews. Yews are very traditional, very formal looking and even though they look kind of tall and skinny from a distance they're actually quite big if you have a large garden you can use use for a hedge they can be actually sheared and I've seen this done at Filoli with electric trimmers and they do push out and they get really dense and green but because they get so dense the interior may die out and that's when you really want to take chunks out so that sunlight can get through. One of my favorite shrubs for a traditional style garden is English laurels. And they are so attractive, look so elegant, they always look great with whatever plant that you're using next to it. English laurels can grow pretty tall, but they can also be maintained at about six feet tall, five feet tall if you wanted to. They have medium colored green foliage that's broad, it's glossy, it's super pretty. They prefer light shade and regular moisture. They need a lot of water. Because they have really broad foliage, you should go in with selective hand pruning. I wouldn't shear it with hand shears, even if you're trying to create like a box-like shape. I would just do the selective pruning to shape it up. Like I mentioned, when you start using the shears on really large foliage, it really looks tore up. It really looks like someone like fruit ninja it, you know? Some other common plants that are used for hedges that aren't evergreen are hydrangeas. 
Hydrangeas can get quite large, especially the mop head varieties, and they can be a hedge that is about six feet tall if you wanted it to be. I think it's nice to have some deciduous hedges mixed in with evergreen plantings. Deciduous plants go through transformation. They bloom and have really showy flowers. They leaf out and are very green during the growing season and then they turn different colors depending on how cold it gets. If it's fall and winter, hydrangea leaves are going to turn yellow usually. Sometimes they turn orange and kind of like burgundy red color but it has a really nice seasonal effect to it. And in winter, all the leaves drop but you can still prune them so that they have a general shape, fairly uniform and you see a pattern going on. Likewise, roses can be used as small hedges. You can use some shrub roses that grow about five feet tall, plant them all together, and prune them at the same height so that they all bloom at the same height and bloom at the same period. Roses have all different habits and some of them can be unreliable. Some of them may go like this, some of them may go like this, even if they're the same variety. So you do definitely have to do research on which roses do best for hedging. For David Austin roses, Queen of Sweden is one of the best for creating a hedgerow. It has a very stiff, upright branch form. It actually kind of looks awkward when you plant one Queen of Sweden rose on its own. It looks a little too stiff and weird, but when you plant them as a hedgerow, it looks amazing. It looks super nice and tidy, very prominent form. And the flower is so pretty. I love it. I love Queen of Sweden. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about Mediterranean climate plants. And I think this is important because, you know, we're gardening in California and we have some serious climate issues. So in my own garden, I have a really old fence. It's really worn out. It doesn't look hot. So let's be real. As a gardener and a landscape designer, I don't make that much money. Let's be real, you know? I'm gonna replace it when it falls down. You know what I mean? But in any case, I don't wanna look at it. So I actually have three pineapple guava shrubs covering it up. These shrubs are totally big enough to cover the entire space and to create privacy. Pineapple guava is good for the Mediterranean climate, but it is not drought tolerant and it is not low water. It is one that responds well to moderate to regular water. It looks better that way. It grows to be about 15 feet tall maximum and you can grow it like a little tree. It takes pruning really well, so you can reduce the height and keep it at about six feet, seven feet tall if you wanted to. You can prune, you can make a lot of pruning mistakes. It's okay, trust me, I know. It's okay, you can even renovate it. You know, pineapple guava has this really beautiful color foliage. It's kind of like silvery gray foliage. Same with olive, and olive is a good option. Olive trees are really good for large estates, especially if you're trying to line a driveway and it's leading up to the home. If you do use trees, it might be better to use one that doesn't produce fruit. Little Ollie grows to be only about four to five feet tall. It can be sheared if you wanted to. You can make a bunch of heading cuts to really bush it out, or you can leave it natural and loose. It needs full sun, good drainage, but it's so attractive in the evening, especially when the moonlight reflects off of the foliage. Another really good one that is good for kind of a low miniature hedge is tucrium. And tucrium is technically an herb. It's often used for hedging. It maxes out at about two and a half feet tall, and you can literally create a box out of it. It could be one foot tall box lining a border of a garden bed. It's often used for herb gardens or kitchen gardens where you're growing vegetables in formal beds. You can also grow it as a hedge and have it be natural and flowing. If you don't prune it, it's going to flower that the bees are really attracted to. It's a really good pollinator plant. Lomandra is a plant that I always go to. It's one of those plants that works well in all styles of gardens and it is multi-purpose and multi-use. And although Lomandra is grass-like and it's not really a bush, it's not really a plant that you can hedge like shearing, it still grows to be good size. When it's planted in repetition, it really does feel like a nice modern hedge. So usually we use 
this Lamandra Breeze, which is a general green color. And that typically grows to be about three by three feet. And I think that's a good size, you know? Another Lamandra that's really popular lately is Platinum Beauty. It's a variegated form, it's brighter, it really pops in the garden. That actually grows larger, it grows to be about four by four. You can really have a substantial low hedge. Now, if you're looking for kind of like a medium to tall hedge and you really want a dense wall, you really want it to be covered, you can use this plant called Podocarpus. It grows really well in Southern California and Northern California, and it's actually a tree. It can grow up to be about 35 feet tall, really large, right? And you're gonna find more of the tree forms in Southern California. It does really well in Los Angeles. Um, but in the Bay Area, we tend to use Podocarpus as hedges. Podocarpus takes pruning really well. It is so malleable. You can grow that plant that typically grows out to be 35 feet and grow it and maintain it at eight feet tall. You could shear it. You can turn it into a box if you wanted to. I've seen it. I don't suggest it. Again, whatever floats your boat. If you wanted to, you could possibly renovate it. There is one downside to Podocarpus though. It does have a tendency of getting city mold. City mold usually happens on Podocarpus when they're planted and grown in shadier spots with poor air circulation. If you do decide to go with the Podocarpus, whether it's Gracilia or the trendy Icy Blue, make sure you do plant them out with full sun and there's good air circulation going on. Finally, let's move on to the California native plants. And I think it's really fun to talk about this. Honestly, I don't really see too many hedges going on in residential gardens, um, except for the occasional manzanita hedge or maybe using a subshrub like salvias. But you'll actually see a lot of California native plants used in commercial properties like campuses or business parks. Frangula, or otherwise known as Ramnus, the name keeps on changing. What is it now? Is it Ramnus or Frangula? I don't know. Anyway, some of us know it as Coffee berry is a really attractive evergreen shrub with dark color foliage and an interesting midrib, kind of reddish purple. It's really pretty. It can grow really tall, maybe about 15 feet, or there are some forms that are more dwarf that grow about four to five feet tall. And it produces these berries that are also attractive, and it's a great overall habitat plant. It's good for shade situations. Another really good plant for kind of a large scale shrub and screening and privacy is Heteromelis. And I had talked talked about this plant in the previous video. You guys can check it out here or here, 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 right here. You can check it out here. It's also known as Toyon or Christmas Berry and it grows to be about 15 feet plus. It's evergreen. It has medium green foliage and it produces these really bright red berries during winter time that the birds enjoy. And with that type of plant, I would definitely keep it informal and natural looking. It just looks better that way. It does take pruning well. So if you do want to reduce the size, you could. Rusavada is one of my favorite California native plants. It is a large scale shrub could get really large. If you ever pass through Southern California in the Palos Verdes region by the cliff sides, you're gonna see a lot of Rusavada there that are huge. I mean, they can be 15 feet, 20 feet wide. So they grow really big. It's really beautiful. You see the Rusavada next to some buckwheats on a cliffside. It looks beautiful. So Rusavada is an evergreen shrub and it has some of the most attractive foliage. It also produces really small insignificant berries or fruit that are edible and that kind of tastes a little sour. But overall, it's a great plant. It can get large, but it takes pruning really well. If you wanted to, you could renovate it. You can start it over. If we're talking about California native plants, we have to talk about manzanitas, Arctostaphylus. Manzanitas are used for hedges. They're a little tricky, but they are beautiful. There's so many species, so many varieties around, and a lot of them originate from many different parts of the state. There are some Arctostaphylus that actually originate from Oregon and other states. If you do decide to go with a manzanita hedge, you definitely want to make sure that you get the right variety. You get the right size that is suited for your microclimate. You want hyper-local species. If you live in San Diego, you do not want to get a variety that originates from Mount Shasta. There aren't too many plants that don't like pruning, but manzanitas are definitely 
one of them. When you do make some pruning cuts into denser branches, like woody branches, those plants can correct themselves. They can heal over, they can kind of create a scab or like compartmentalize. But manzanitas can't do that. They can't heal over. That branch dies back. That dieback affects the next branch. You don't want to prune a manzanita, okay? Next, let's talk about Ceanothus. Ceanothus is almost the opposite of manzanitas when it comes to hedging. You know, manzanitas, a lot of them are actually slow growing. So you may want to start off with a larger plant to get the hedge going. Ceanothus is really fast growing. You can develop a hedge quickly, but you know, with most fast growing plants, they tend to be short lived. If you have a Ceanothus growing in your garden and there's some irrigation going on and the soil is kind of loamy or the soil isn't like the native soil, the Ceanothus may have a short life. You can plan for having that hedge anywhere from 5 to about 12 years. But Ceanothus does really grow fast and it creates coverage fast. It creates height fast and it can take pruning really well. So you can do some shearing cuts on Ceanothus. It's going to bush out. It's going to look more green and produce more flowers. But at the same time, when it gets dense, you really have to open it up. Get that sunlight to the interior so the interior doesn't die out. Now if you're looking for a plant that you can treat similarly to like boxwood where you want to create boxes or shapes or topiaries. One of the plants that probably is best suited for that is Bacris. Bacris comes in generally two sizes. One that is four to five feet tall, maybe even six feet, and you can find this throughout California. And then one that is really low growing that's treated like a ground cover that grows to be about one to two feet tall. Bacris is interesting because I think technically Bacris is a subshrub and subshrubs don't like pruning into wood. When the branches get more mature and woody, a lot of subshrubs can't handle the pruning. They don't sprout up. But for some reason, Bacris does. So with Bacris, you can do the heck out of shearing. You can renovate it. You know, you can do a lot of things. A couple of things with Bacris. First, you definitely want to plant it in full sun. Bacris does not perform well in shade. It tends to get powdery mildew and it's not pretty. Second thing is Bacris has a male form and a female form. The female form produces flowers every single year. If you do plant a hedge with 10 plants and some of them are male and female, the hedge may look patchy, you know? It may look green and then suddenly there's one that looks like creamish yellow flowers and then green and then it breaks up that visual continuity. If you want that uniform look, you probably want to make sure that those plants get sexed and you're planting all male or all female plants. One of the best California native plants that are really good for creating some sort of barrier, barrier against people <laughs> or barrier against deer, is Prunus elicifolia. Prunus is so bulletproof and versatile. It's amazing and it is attractive. So this plant has foliage that is holly-like and it's pokey. Or when deer approach it, they're gonna be pricked, right? It's evergreen, it's got glossy, kind of dark to medium foliage, and it can grow tall. You can maintain a hedge that's maybe about eight feet tall if you wanted to, or you can have a hedge that's about four feet tall. And it takes pruning well. You can create shapes or you can keep it natural, but you can also renovate it. If you had a really mature hedge, already established. Eight feet tall. You don't like the thick wall. You want it brought down. You want to be able to see the street. You can actually hack it down and it will survive and you can maintain a shrub that low. All right, that's all I got for hedging in this video and I hope this was helpful and not too overwhelming. I know this was a lot of information, but let me know what you guys think. The best way for me to see what's going on and what you guys are interested in is direct feedback. So I always enjoy your comments and as a gardener, we're constantly learning and I think knowledge sharing is super important. If you've had some positive or negative experiences creating a hedge and you have some tips or maybe some suggestions for plants that are good for hedging, um, particularly California natives. I'm always looking for California native plants that are good to bring into gardens. Please let us all know down below. All right, well have a good evening. Catch you again later. Bye.